Krista was skint. Poverty was the lot of the art student, of course, but the attraction of the lifestyle was wearing a little thin. She wanted to work and to earn from her work, but the obvious way forward wasn't making itself clear to her. Having taken the huge step of defying her family and training to be a sculptor, she was beginning to wonder if she could keep it up. She had qualms about whether she was special enough, sufficiently gifted to stand out from the mass of other young artists buzzing around Munich. She felt ill all the time, worn out. She wasn't wholly convinced that she was going in the right direction, but couldn't see any way out for the time being. And then she met a baron. You're listening to The Kiss, the story of the women who made a movie masterpiece, and this is episode five, The Baroness. Crystal Winslow was 25 years old. Baron Lajos Hartvani was 34. In 1913, within a year of meeting, they were married. I don't know exactly how they met, I'm afraid, and so I can't paint a picture of that first encounter. But for all their difference in wealth, they moved in similar circles, mixed with bohemians, artists and intellectuals. Krista's new husband is a fascinating figure. Lajos Hatvani was a Hungarian nobleman, Lajos being Louis in English, Ludwig in German. To close friends and family, and to his wife, he was known by the shortened form Lazi. He looked extraordinarily like my grandfather, also Hungarian and virtually the same age. A broad forehead, thick, close-cropped hair, neat, upright. Lazi came from the super-rich of Central Europe. His family, originally called Deutsch, had made its wealth in the sugar industry in the 1820s and gained aristocratic status, adding the title Hotvani to their surname, after Hotvan, the town in which they lived. Lutzi's father, the Baron Hotvani Deutsch, as well as being an industrialist, was a respected political figure, patron of the arts and philanthropist. But his sons wanted something different. Lazi set his sights on being a writer and his brother Ferenc an artist. In fact, Lazi's father, the old baron, is quoted as once complaining, what can you do about my sons? One of them is an artist and the other one is just as mad. Perhaps the most galling act of rebellion by the young Lazi and his brother was their decision to abandon their Jewish faith and convert to Christianity dropping the original family name of Deutsch. Lutzi had argued that far from being heretical, conversion to Christianity was a logical way for Jews to assimilate in Hungary. The fact of his wealth is important. Lutzi's behaviour, his freedom, his travels, his courage to say things others might not, his impulsive decisions, were all probably the result of having an awful lot of money at his disposal. He and his brother managed to carve a name for themselves in the arts. Their two cousins, Lily and Antonia, followed suit and also converted. They, as it happens, were also successful writers, particularly the prodigious young playwright Lily. Lutzi wrote plays, poetry and fiction, but his wealth made him attractive to other writers as a patron, and his considerable energies were often pushed away from his own literary aspirations. He did it gladly counting among his genuine friends some of the biggest names in literature and music. He was also a committed journalist, an outspoken political liberal who helped found Nugat, a Hungarian for West, one of the most influential journals in Central Europe in the first half of the 20th century. This neat, dapper and good-looking aristocrat was an enterprising and socially active young man, who passionately loved his country, literature, and any number of young actresses. At the age of 20, while still a student, he'd come across a 17-year-old girl called Yulia working as a general dog's body at a brothel in Budapest. The girl had had a horrendous life, losing her mother very young, and had been kicked from one crisis to another. Lutzi got it into his head that he could 
Professor Higgins' style, take this pearl away from the drudgery of cleaning up after clients and turn her into a society lady. He set the teenager up in an apartment, teaching her how to hold her own in high society and falling in love with her in the process. They lived openly as a couple and had two children together, Lily and Karoy, although Lutzi's father absolutely refused to allow them to marry. Lutzi's literary commitments forced him to travel abroad, and while he was away, he asked a succession of friends, some of the biggest names in Hungarian literature, to keep an eye on his young lover. While abroad, and in the throes of a relationship with a German actress, he found time to write to his good friend, the author Shandor Brody, to check that Julia wasn't having any affairs in his absence. In the following years, even as their relationship waned, he never abandoned her financially, and there was no question that the children shouldn't have the influential hot funny surname. Part of Yulia's society training was art classes, specifically sculpture. Lutzi wanted to nurture talent when he saw it, and took immense pleasure from playing a role in others' creative processes. This is what makes such an effective and important patron of the arts. Far from feeling any kind of rivalry with other writers, he specifically sought them out. It was when one of his plays was being staged in Munich that he struck up his friendship with the German writer Thomas Mann. Mann was still building his reputation, and the two men were naturally drawn to each other. The Baron wanted to immerse himself in the local artistic scene at once. They attended literary gatherings and mixed with the creative set, and it was probably at one of these social events that Lutzi found himself talking to a young and striking sculptor, a woman of huge charm and even greater self-doubt. She didn't know if she'd ever make it, she told him. She wondered if she was kidding herself and was on the point of packing it all in. Baron Lajos Hotfany was in his favourite territory. He had found a lover and a project at the same time. I must say, I struggle a bit to get my head round this marriage, to understand the true nature of their relationship. Lutzi led what his friend, the Hungarian poet Odiendra, called a mad and unbridled love life. He was a kind of cultured playboy, hopping around the glamorous capitals of Europe, gathering to himself anyone of any note. It's impossible to know what drew them to each other, but years later, Krista would insist that they were always good friends, if not exactly lovers. They were both comfortable in literary and artistic circles, as well as in aristocratic ones, and they enjoyed each other's company. I imagine that Lutzi was not the kind of man it was easy to say no to anyway. I've seen letters he wrote to his lovers, and they were demanding and passionate. It couldn't have been very hard to be swept up by the charming young Hungarian aristocrat. Lutzi was nine years older than Krista, well-travelled, with astonishing connections, and the social confidence that came of his class. Krista, though wholly attracted to women, did on occasion succumb to the much more overwhelming demands of men. She was open to any affection, and drawn by the promise of love and protection. Krista was a very noticeable kind of woman, statuesque, unusual, a real bohemian, a character... She was also an artist in need of support. Not least, she was from an upper-class, if destitute, background. And the Baron Hotfunny was something of a snob when it came to marital relations. Years later, he got worked up by the news that his daughter Lily was being pursued by a middle-class suitor, a very ordinary young man. There was absolutely no way he would accept any connection with what he called a bourgeois philistine. Krista could hold her own among august company. She was eccentric, not a little snobbish herself at times. She enjoyed dinner parties and loved good food. She particularly relished the company of other women and was about to raise a few eyebrows in these new circles with her increasingly mannish attire. Their marriage, in the winter of 1913, catapulted Krista into a world of immense wealth and influence. She went from being a penniless artist to a Hungarian baroness. True, her baron wasn't the type to sit around in a palace cultivating rare orchids, 
but it was still a huge reversal in her fortunes. She swapped her dingy studio for opulent hotels and a huge dream car of a Benz, driven by a liveried chauffeur. God, she loved that car, and all cars thereafter, relishing automotive transport as the greatest of freedoms. The power to get up and go as far away as possible was as delicious an idea to her now as a pair of trousers had been in her childhood. Whether she was really concerned about her future as a sculptor or going through a brief crisis, she realised that Lottie was not going to let her leave go of her ambitions. He wanted her to flourish and create. They decided on Paris as their new home. There they could combine his love of literary society with her need to build a career. Krista was enrolled in art school and had the luxury of her very own studio in one of the grandest quarters of the city, where she could work on and house her statues. They led a beautiful life in Paris. They were a confident and gregarious couple, attending parties, sporting events, the theatre, and they were good companions to each other, well-matched, interesting and entertaining. There was nothing bland or shallow about this lively Hungarian nobleman and his handsome German wife. But it was 1914, and this beautiful lifestyle could not continue in an enemy country. One day, an unknown man was shown into Christa's studio. Instinctively, as a sculptor, she examined his face. But there was nothing remarkable or interesting about it at all. There he stood in her glorious workroom, among the graceful busts and statues, entirely out of place. Even she felt a little stunned by the place at times. A year ago, she'd been making the best of what shabby spaces she could find in Munich. Today, she was working in her own echoing atelier, in the Luxembourg Gardens of all places, one of the most exclusive addresses in Paris. As the stranger spoke, it became clear that he knew an awful lot about the Baron and Baroness Hartwani already. Christa assumed by his demeanour that he was a policeman. You're a German national, madam, is that right? he asked. She told him she was now a Hungarian by marriage and title. The feeling that she wasn't wanted there must have been distantly familiar to Christa. She had felt it years ago when her soldier father had been posted to the garrison town of Strasbourg. The whole family had gone with him to that cramped walled city which had recently belonged to the French, but which, thanks to its strategically placed fortress, was too important to the Prussian army to leave alone. They'd besieged it and captured it and placed their own troops there by the time the little Prussian girl had arrived. The feeling of loathing and hostility by the French residents towards the German occupiers was ever simmering. I'll need to see your official papers, said the visitor. She didn't have any papers, she told him. What did a war have to do with her? This was Paris, not a festering little garrison town. This was a city bustling with all the nationalities of the world, a thrilling cosmopolitan centre where she and Lotzi, her writer husband, had decided to settle. It was exactly the right place for them, because it was full of people just like them, Beautiful, refined, artistic, above all, enlightened people, detached from grubby politics. I can send home for official documents, she suggested to her visiting policeman. Then I suggest you hurry, madam, he warned her. You haven't got much time. In the end, they left everything behind. Their furniture, books, papers, her sketches and sculptures. And they decided to give the train a miss too. It was full of desperate people. That was no way to travel. They'd take the bends and cross Europe, see what was playing out in this darkening continent. Heading back to Lottie's homeland of Hungary, they were stopped time and time again by temporary barriers manned by armed soldiers. At each one, they waited politely in the back of the car while papers were looked at, orders sought somewhere out of sight. They travelled deeper into the heart of the continent. For Christa closer to the life of a baroness. The Hotfunny family home was known as the Grisalkovich Mansion, named after the family that built it in the town of Hotfun in the mid-18th century. It's not like a British castle, if you're trying to picture it. It's typical of its time and place, warm yellow in colour, 
low and wide, more a Baroque townhouse amid beautiful gardens than an ancient stronghold. It was here that Christa settled for the next few years of her life, busying herself in her beautiful new studio and playing hostess. There's a rather brutal description of Christa from this period, written by Ilona Harmosh, the wife of the great Hungarian writer Dessa Kostolányi. Harmos wrote a series of pen portraits of the wives of great writers. Odd choice, but there you go. They were probably written much later, in the 1950s perhaps, and based on memories, and they're not what you'd call unbiased. Very entertaining and eccentric, though. I've made a stab at translating her entry about Krista. Prepare yourself, it's not nice. Just for clarity, the word fabelhaft is German for fabulous. Here we go. Fabelhaft, fabelhaft. That's what she said about everything, with her deathly boredom, whether it was someone dying, a revolution or a piece of art. Fabelhaft. She was bored with everything, mainly her husband. She was full of spleen and could laugh with malice. She liked going about in men's clothes. Tall, with broad shoulders and hazy eyes, she behaved among us like some posh person who was just passing through. It felt like she was playing out a role of a man, and maybe she loved a few women, but the person she always loved the most was herself. You couldn't imagine her as a mother, but only as a loyal girlfriend. She had beautiful, long, pearly white hands. She was a sculptor. She mainly did animal sculpture, which was meant to suggest that she looked down her nose at humans and that she belonged in the aristocracy. Even the highest of the high, like the British, she wished. These sculptures were as smooth and dull and highfalutin as she was. You couldn't like them, just acknowledge them. They were impersonal, lacking in passion, and had a grotesqueness of the species, not as individuals. They were undeniably noble, elegant, and as indifferent as she was. Who knows what went on between Krista and Ilona Harmosh, but it's clearly personal. I ought to point out in Krista's defence that years later friends described her as a very dear and good-hearted individual. Also, as we'll find out later, she carried out some particularly selfless and brave acts in the Second World War in relation to refugees. As for her art, in 1918 she held her first Hungarian exhibition in Budapest, a collaboration between her and Lati's artist brother Ferenc. I've seen some pictures of it, and grainy though the images are, Krista's statues seem very striking and lovely to me. However, what we can safely deduce from Ilona Harmosh's acid portrait is that Krista was probably bored. The marriage was not a success. Lutzi had affair after affair, and there's no doubt that his behaviour upset and confused his wife. Also, there was an awful lot of political talk in the gatherings at Hotvan, and as an observer later pointed out, Krista didn't really sit at the politics side of the table. But she had one relationship in Hotvan that she prized dearly, and that was with Lutzi's sister, Irene. I've seen a couple of pictures of Irene, and she exudes a gentleness that I can only guess at. She was only two years older than Krista, and the two women got on very well. Irene, who was married with a daughter, was devoted to the beautiful 20-acre gardens at the Hotvani Palace and cultivated rare plants there. Maybe her gentleness and warmth reminded Krista of her mother, supplied the easy, loving companionship she always craved. Change was coming to Europe as well as to the Hatvani marriage. When the Great War ended, Hungary's politics were in turmoil. The monarchy was out and the government was taken over by the communists under Béla Kuhn. Lutzi became a member of the Hungarian National Council as a Democrat. When the communists were suppressed in 1919, Lutzi went on to badmouth the new leader, the conservative Miklos Horthy. This brought the world down on his head and he and Krista had to escape, spending a couple of nights hiding in the zoo. They washed up in Vienna. Lutzi hated Vienna. No one was happy. 
Lotzi, nearly 50, in exile, restless, fell in love with a much younger woman and wanted a divorce. Later accounts of this period state that Christa was deeply saddened by the request and consented to the divorce very unwillingly. But she wasn't abandoned as such. She went to Berlin and settled for a while in the Hotel Esplanade, where Lotzi paid her living expenses. She also rented a studio and made plans for an exhibition. The path of her life was changing once again, and she was about to re-enter the world of the struggling artist. Maybe it was the unhappiness of her newly single status, maybe just a deeper running sensitivity. But Krista found that her mind kept revisiting those years of her life that had made their most lasting impression, her childhood and her time at the boarding school where she had so dearly craved the love of another woman. Next time on The Kiss, we return to Leontine, the young South African girl dreaming of Europe, and hear about her determination to carve a career as a leading actress. The Kiss was written and presented by Bibi Berkey. Studio production was by Francis Nutbeam Webber. It was directed by Mark Lingwood and the original music was composed by Timothy Bond. It was brought to you by Tempest Productions.